and begin. We'll give it just a few moments to give folks a chance to log in. All right. Good evening and welcome to our live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Jessica from Greenlight and we are thrilled to host tonight's event with Hermione Lee, author of the new biography, Tom Stoppard, A Life, in conversation with none other than Tom Stoppard himself. Before we begin, I just wanna say a huge thanks to the team at Knopf and everyone else who contributed to bringing this event together and to all of you for showing up. Though we're not able to host events in our store spaces, our community of authors and readers is still here. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversation and connection. Now, a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, in our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see and hear you. Um, you can see a count of fellow attendees at the top of your Zoom screen if you're curious. There are a couple different ways you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we do encourage. The first is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like a speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. It's a great way to show your appreciation for the authors and interact with fellow attendees. Just make sure you're set to panelists and attendees so everyone can see your comments. If you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by the author, please post that question in the Q&A module. You can find that by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program. We are recording tonight's event, so look for video or audio versions on our social media channels later on. If you purchase a book bundle ticket for tonight's event, thank you so much. If you selected to have your book shipped, you should already have received an email with shipment information and your book plate signed by Hermione will be mailed separately to you. If you choose to pick up your book at one of our store locations, you'll get an email tomorrow notifying you when your book is ready for pickup with signed book plate included. If you didn't get a bundled ticket, or if you're interested in other works by Hermione Lee and Tom Stoppard, you can click on the link I'll drop in the chat to find many of their works available for purchase from Greenlight Bookstore for pickup or shipping. It's a great way to show your support for the authors and the bookstore. Now I have the great honor of introducing tonight's speakers. Tom Stoppard was born in Czechoslovakia in 1937 and moved to England via Singapore and India with his family in 1946. In 1967, Stoppard's first full-length play, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern Are Dead, was staged by the National Theatre, followed by other award-winning works, including Jumpers, Travesties, Night and Day, The Real Thing, Hapgood, Arcadia, Indian Ink, The Invention of Love, The Coast of Utopia trilogy, Rock and Roll, The Hard Problem, and most recently, Leopoldstadt. His many stage adaptations and translations include Schnitzler's Undiscovered Country, Nestroy's On the Razzle, Pirandello's Henry IV, and The Seagull, The Cherry Orchard, and Ivanov by Chekhov. Stoppard has also written for radio, television, and film with screenwriting credits including Brazil, Empire of the Sun, Enigma, and Shakespeare in Love, which won an Academy Award for Best Original Screenplay. He directed his own screenplay of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern Are Dead in 1990, which won the Golden Lion at the Venice Film Festival. Stoppard received a knighthood in 1997, and in 2000 was awarded the Order of Merit by Her Majesty the Queen. Hermione Lee was president of Wolfson College from 2008 to 2017 and is Emeritus Professor of English Literature at Oxford University. Her work includes biographies of Virginia Woolf, Edith Wharton, and Penelope Fitzgerald, winner of the James Tate Black Prize and one of the New York Times 10 Best Books of 2014. She's also written books on Elizabeth Bowen, Philip Roth, and Willa Cather. Lee was awarded the Biographers Club Prize for Exceptional Contribution to Biography in 2018. She's a fellow of the British Academy and the Royal Society of Literature and a foreign honorary member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In 2003, she was made a CBE. For us Americans, that's a commander in the most excellent order of the British Empire. And in 2013, she was made a Dane for services to literary scholarship. Her new biography of Tom Stoppard was highly praised by fellow authors and critics on both sides of the Atlantic. Harper's calls it an extraordinary record of a vital and evolving artistic life replete with textured illuminations of the plays and their performances and shaped by the arc of Stoppard's exhilarating engagement with the world around him and of his awakening to his own past. So we're all very lucky to be in the virtual room for a conversation between these two extraordinary artists this evening. Dame Hermione and Sir Tom will be speaking together and then answering your questions towards the end of the hour. To start things off, I hope you'll join me in welcoming Hermione Lee. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's it's really great uh, to, to be here. Um, 
I do want to say how lucky I feel and how lucky I imagine we all feel to be in your virtual company, Tom, uh, today. So thank you very much for coming and for talking tonight. Um, since we're in Brooklyn tonight, and I wish we really were in Brooklyn, uh, I'd like to start by talking to you a bit about your relationship with America. And when we were having our conversations for this book over several years, uh, I was always asking you to think back to your past and you very patiently did so. Um, one of the early scenes that we went back to uh, was your childhood in Darjeeling between the ages of four and eight, 1942 to 1946. And I think that there the presence of Americans for you was quite a, a sort of dramatic and romantic thing, wasn't it? Glamorous. <laughs> They were glamorous, and they were. Um, we were. We weren't actually part of the Raj. We were Czech refugees, but uh, you know, we were part of not. We were. We, we were not part of the empire or anything to do with the empire. But grateful to be there, and uh, I should say that it was, as far as. I've um, remembered it. It was a happy childhood in India, and uh, I dreamed about Darjeeling for many years afterwards. Mm -hmm. I was always slightly sorry to wake up. It was a good. It was a good place to be between the age of four and eight. Mm -hmm. of course, I had no sense at the time of how very fortunate my brother and I had been to be there at all, or indeed anywhere outside. Um, a faith one can't contemplate. Mm. But um, I got to England, as you say, in 46, and I, am, am, I embraced it and I felt embraced by it. And I already spoke only English as my first language. I barely had any words of Czech. They'd all dropped away because I was educated in the English language from the moment I got to India when I was only five. And is it true that you used to hang out, hang around outside your house in Darjeeling, hoping that these rather glamorous American soldiers would give you some gum? Yes, any gum chum was the way we <laughs> Did you really say that? <laughs> and they were, they were usually very generous. Um, but, but those who didn't use chewing gum always apologized. That's very sweet. Um, so yeah, so jump, jumping on um, uh, into your youth, um, people have asked me since my book came out uh, whether there were things I found out about your life that surprised me. And actually, one of the things I didn't know at all uh, about was your early admiration as a schoolboy and a young journalist for American writers, writers such as Thurber and Cummings and Arthur Miller. And I think you told me about an extraordinary interview that you did with Steinbeck when you were in your early 20s. Is that right? Yes. yes. Uh, uh, quite right about that. I mean, I absolutely went for modern American literature, and I don't really know what turned me on, but um, sometime, I, I, I don't know what year this would be, but as you say, in my 20s, John Steinbeck came to England and he, he hunkered down in Somerset to write a book. And um, a friend of mine who was a fellow junior reporter with me, we drove down to Bruton and we found him. Of course, I was too overawed. So when he came to the door and explained that he wasn't going to be interviewed, um, I was fulsome in my apologies for knocking on his door. Indeed, I brought a bunch of flowers, I believe. Um, <laughs> So he said, since I've been so polite about it, uh, he let me interview him when he was finished. And back in the Dorchester Hotel a few months later, um, I did a rather unprofessional interview, <laughs> which I've always remembered. I've also treasured a couple of quite long letters he wrote me mm -hmm. in his own mm -hmm. hand. Um, but the real American presence in literature for me was Ernest Hemingway. Yes. And it's a, more or less a commonplace to say that one grows out of him. 
and in a way one does, but whenever I open a Hemingway just casually again, the old spell envelops me again. Uh, I, I can't honestly say that any other writer had such an impact on me. Uh, but you know, I'll just add, as writing, um, I would say the same, but in a different way, about Evelyn Waugh, mm. Elizabeth II. Mm. That's so interesting. I think people would be surprised to hear that about you and Hemingway, because it's not, it's not the first person that would come to mind. And it, do you think it was something to do with the sort of the way in which there's a lot of emotion, but it's kept under control, it's kept back, it's kept in reserve in the writing? Could it be something to do with that? Well, that's what they say. It's, um, withheld information. Yes. But his subject matter was very often dramatic. And when it wasn't exactly dramatic, a story like Hills Like White Elephants, elephants um, it, uh, it hit the spot for me. Mm. Uh, I would say that the volume which came out titled The Fifth Column and the First 49 Stories uh, would have to be one of my desert island books. Oh. Fifth column, as Hermione knows, gentlemen and ladies, uh, it was a play written by Hemingway, which um, is never revived, as far as I know. Um, there, there are examples of extraordinary and exceptional writers who somehow don't, don't quite get it right when they step outside mm. what they mostly do. Mm. Um, so Hemingway's plays is not particularly good. It's all right. But Hemingway as a prose stylist, and I, I, I dare say even as some kind of exemplar of how to live, you know, mm. um, his life being almost entirely unlike mine, but I had to put the almost in because I have been fishing for trout uh, since childhood. And, Very good. Uh, yes. with him. and Elliot too, T.S. Eliot was a huge uh, influence on you in the early days, wasn't he? Yes, but again, it, it was, um, how do I put this? Uh, I never really kept up properly after 1930, probably. Um, 1922 was a huge year for me, um, though I didn't know it. <laughs> uh, it was the wasteland. Mm. It, it was Ulysses. It was Proust. Mm. And there were other extraordinary things happening. And uh, it struck me much, much later but I hadn't understood how recent all that was. Um, I discovered all this maybe 30 years after these things had been published. Uh, yeah, probably, I, I, I was um, 23 mm. in 1960. So certainly looking back now from this vantage point, looking back, 35 years mm. uh, is much more, it's a much shorter period. Uh, we all know how time shrinks as you get older. Yes, indeed. At the, at the time I, I encountered this work, these books, um, they seem to be lost in the mists of history. Mm. Now I think, good God, that was, but I mean, 30 years ago, um, I could work out which play I had on, and it doesn't seem very long ago. <laughs> Just the other day. So get jumping on in time, since you're talking about time truncating, um, when you had your first big triumph in the States with Rose, as here, it was uh, in, in, in Britain, uh, with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, which was in October 1967 in the, in the States, did you find Staying with the American theme for a moment, did you find then 
or later that putting a play on, for instance, in New York is a different experience from putting a play on, say, at the National Theatre or in the West End in London. Yes, it's more, more concentrated in some way. Um, Why? Well, its importance is concentrated. A lot seems to ride or fall. Um, you know, here we are really in a branch of economics. Um, but because of, I should say, New York theatre rather than American theatre. Okay. But New York theatre made one feel that was one part of a breathtaking, breathless adventure uh, in which uh, success was total or disaster likewise. Um, I didn't enjoy it. And I, mm. to this day, uh, I'm not comfortable with it. But uh, it's nice to be in a town which really a large section of that town really loves theatre. But do audiences in America, this is a ridiculous generalisation, do audiences in America treat your plays differently? Do they laugh at different things? Do they react no, radically no. differently to what, to what a play is doing? Not in any significant way. No not in a significant way. Of course, there are parochial and local references which escape them um, as American uh, plays escape us just um, in one place or another during the course of the play. Um, I say that, but actually, partly because I'd read so much American writing, um, I don't actually remember really more than one or two uh, moments where an American play lost me. Have you had any, have you had any sort of memorable, particularly memorable American productions, either for good or ill? Um, oh my, uh, this is, a, this is going to be tricky to negotiate. Um, <laughs> uh, Up to you. I don't, I don't actually recall a really juicy example of for ill, okay. but um, as, as regards for good, um, I have not only had plays performed, but I've attended the process, attended rehearsals, seen the result and so forth in a wide variety of kinds of theatre on every scale. Um, I'm close, for example, to the Wilmer Theatre in Philadelphia, which is quite a small theatre. Um, and uh, similarly, uh, thanks originally to Bill Ball and later and latterly to Kerry Perloff, I'm very, very at home in the San Francisco mm. Erie Street Theatre, which is a regular West End size theatre. Um, again, the, uh, the atmosphere and the attitude towards de doing theatre um, is more uh, is more intense in America. Um, slightly, uh, slightly holy, actually. Um, holy. Well, in a sense, yeah. There's, there's a feeling that um, um, a sermon from the director would be a you know very <laughs> an appropriate event at a rehearsal in America. Right. A sermon which brings in you know the tradition and where we are. Yeah. And we hope for everything is um, everything is. Uh, I wish I could. I wish I could reach for the exact word. It's not a piety, but there's an utter sincerity about yes. it. Yes, yes. And maybe in England we just think, oh, let's just get on with it, you know. <laughs> um, yes. I've said this before, I remember, uh, so I'm repeating myself, but I'll make it brief. I was in rehearsal uh, in, in New York with some kind of serious play, and the rehearsals were a bit like a party. But I had a friend rehearsing in the same building in a thriller. 
And it really struck me when I went to visit that in the thriller rehearsal, you would have thought they were doing murder in the cathedral. <laughs> and in my rehearsal, you'd have thought <laughs> the rehearsals hadn't started yet. That's wonderful. You did, you did a, um, produ a famous production of uh, The Real Thing, with, uh, where, which was directed by Mike Nichols. And I noticed there's a new, I haven't seen it yet, but there's a new biography of Mike Nichols has, uh, has just come out. And I wondered if you recalled what that experience was like working with him, because I know he became a very good friend of yours. He was a wonderful, wonderful man. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, I didn't see him as often as one would like to see a really close friend. Um, I first met him when he wanted me to write a script for a film from a novel um, by P.D. James. And uh, it wasn't my cup of tea, really. But he showed up at my house um, to chat. And just being in his presence, I'm sure he knew what he was doing, but by the time he'd been around the house for an hour, um, one would have done anything to work with him, um, which I then did. Mm. It didn't help, but it was great <laughs> to know him. <laughs> you, you, tell a, you tell a funny story about one of your experiences of working with him in the rehearsals for The Real Thing. I think it was the first rehearsal and he turned to you and asked you what you thought of what was going on and you said perhaps this bit could be taken rather slowly, quite slowly. And, and he said yes, or very, very fast. Yes. Um, you don't quite do it justice because what I do it justice. What you said was well, there's nothing really I want to say about this scene. It's not necessary that it be done, um, you know, in a very leisurely, well-placed, slowish kind of pace. And he said, yes, yes, quite agree. Or very, very quickly. <laughs> and um, yeah, that was, that was his way. Um, it was it? Sorry, go on. You were going to finish it. Yeah. You know, it was a very good production. Mm. The whole experience of working with him and being in Boston for opening out of town and all that kind of thing. Oh, it was oh, it was fun. Mm. It was just fun to be in his radius. Just a bit before that, you wrote a, a, a sort of comic short play, quite a curious play. Um, in the 1970s called Newfoundland, which was a sort of spoof of American styles, bits of Whitman and, and other people. And it was really a celebration of the land of the free. And it was certainly not the sort of play about America that your, that contem your contemporary left-wing playwrights would have been writing at the time. So, it's a big question really about America then. I mean, did your love of America that we've been talking about a bit tonight have a political component at that time, which had to do with free speech and democracy? It was all this, but filtered through the movies. Um, yes. As I recall it, it was a long monologue which tried to present America in one speech. Um, and it did so through the prism of Hollywood, partly. Um, but yes, it, it, it was the froth of my love affair on the surface of this really rather deep feeling for America. You know, when we were talking earlier about Hemingway and Steinbeck, I, I, I might have added that I was reading contemporary American fiction mm. with much more interest and avidity than English. Uh, contemporary fiction. I mean, uh, Mailer was, it was kind of, it, it was early or early, mod, early modern Mailer, but I kept with him for quite a long way until he, until he was re writing very, very long books, which didn't get to me. But um, yeah, Updike, Roth and so on, you, you, well, you, you're, you're the Roth expert. Um, 
I was in a restaurant in Bristol when I was in a newspaper there, and there was a there was a reporter on the paper who I felt was well above me in intelligence and style. He wore a bow tie, by the way. <laughs> and and um, he asked me if I'd ever come across uh, the catcher in the rye. And I'd never heard of it at that point. Um, that, that, you know, for, for anybody who was kind of reading books in the 1950s mm -hmm. as they came off the press, The Catcher in the Rye was a huge moment. Um, mm -hmm. And we might have mentioned when we were speaking about the earlier generations, we should have mentioned Fitzgerald, of course. Yes. Um, so, yes, um, despite the fact that uh, you know, I kind of had my minor passion and uh, for uh, uh, British writers generally, but Evelyn Waugh in particular. Uh, American writers um, appealed to me, they got under my guard in some way, and it mm -hmm. may have been a kind of knock on effect from any gum chum, you know. I wondered. Yeah. Of the gate. I'm going to jump us about. 50 years on, um, to think about the present. Um, one of the heartbreaking aspects of the pandemic has been the closure of theatres um, and the effect of that on the whole theatrical uh, profession. Uh, your play, Leopold Sturz, went dark in London on the 14th of March 2020, which is getting on for a, a year ago now. Do you see any hope of its return in the UK or of its being put on in the States? Well, there is a decision for the play to return when theatre reopens, or well, not just reopens. I don't think it's going to come back while we have socially distanced audiences and all that, but uh, probably when we have vaccination passports and that kind of thing, um, there's every intention to bring the play back and also to bring it to New York. Um, so I've, I've been saying that and I've been told so um, for quite a long time now. One's first hopes were that it might be back in a rehearsal a month from now. Yes. That's not going to happen, but it might, it might be in a rehearsal in, in August, for example. Well, that's a very exciting thing to think about. So for, for people who, who haven't managed to, to see it um, or read it, Leopold Stadt uh, tells the story of a Jewish Viennese family through the late 19th to the mid 20th century with a hist their historical um, intermarriage and assimilation um, in Vienna, whose, whose lives are destroyed by the Third Reich and the, the Holocaust. So it, it's a deeply moving play and it has a strong bearing on your own life. It's been received as your most autobiographical play uh, till now. Why, why has that happened now? Why did you write it in these last few years, do you think? Oh gosh, it's autobiographical up to a point, um, but the last part of the play is much more truly autobiographical. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's a, a young man who came to Britain and his name was changed and turned into a, an English schoolboy and then into an English young man and so on. Um, why now? Well, um, I'm glad it was now because I didn't know how long I was supposed to put it off. I never seriously got into even thinking about writing such a play. Uh, I had thought about writing a play which might have been a kind of um, biographical play about, about the life I might have had if my mother had taken us back to Czechoslovakia after the war. Um, but subsequent to that, um, a play called Rock and Roll, which has been done here and there in America, was very much a play of the late 60s and onward, um, 
about about Charter seventy seven, yes. uh, about Czechoslovakia and modern history, and there was quite a lot of overlap with my thinking. Uh, again, um, the young man in there was did not have my life, and I didn't have his, but we shared a lot of opinions. But it's it's taken you in your life a very long time to write, if not directly autobiographically, then to a degree autobiographically about um, the history, the, the Jewish history that to an extent you didn't know about for quite a long time in your life. Of course, you knew that your father was Jewish, um, but your mother uh, didn't talk about her past, was very anxious that you and your brother should be completely assimilated, didn't speak Czech, didn't, didn't tell you for, for a very long time until you actually found out from a from a cousin that that members of her family members of your family had been killed in the holocaust um and it's that, that slow drive that obviously led towards leopold Sturt. um but i still ask myself even after having written your biography you know why why that took so many decades to germinate into a play um well, yes, what could it be? By that time, um, I'd, been, I'd been written about quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And very often, one could almost say usually, um, my ignorance of being Jewish was exaggerated. I mean, I read something just the other day where they said that I didn't know my mother was Jewish. Well, of course I did. Um, it's just that, um, because of my temperament, perhaps, I just went along with my mother's obvious desire not to live in the past. Not merely not live in it, but not so, as it were, bring it back with her. And very occasionally we talk about this and she'd be perfectly upfront about re really um, just moving on with her life. Um, she also, I think had this feeling that my brother Peter and I uh, would, would suffer in some way from British anti-Semitism. We never did. Um, I'm pretty sure I can say that I never encountered anything like that. Um, but that's partly because I no longer had my Jewish name. I didn't think of myself as Jewish in any important way. Um, and perhaps that puts up some kind of filter for any comment which might have come at you. Uh, but there was a feeling, I'm, I'm actually not quite answering your question, there, there was a feeling that um, I felt I was so somehow too self-satisfied. I used to refer to my charmed life, and by God, it was a charmed life in a certain sense. But um, I never really said, I never really made reference to my charmed life with uh, proper humility. It was, all, it was always uh, presented to, by myself, to myself, as something on which one might be congratulated. And um, it probably finally got through to me that this got up some people's noses. There's also a very interesting subject to write about, by the way. Mm. It gathered together a lot of things which I didn't have to go and find. I, had, I yes. just had to reach for them. Yes, yes. Uh, I was moved by... I was moved by writing the play. And you were moved. I remember sitting in... Uh, having the good luck to sit in rehearsals of... Leopold Stutt, um, and you you were moved by seeing it, by seeing the actors bring this to life. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Mm. Um, I have to say that it was a wonderful, I mean, just to be rather objective of, about such things, it was, um, it was a very good opportunity, um, just thrust at me by, Sonia Friedman, who produced the play, uh, to write anything I wanted without any kind of concerns 
about how many characters it could have and so on. So I just let it go. I just mm -hmm. imagined it as being, you know, a large play, um, which was a terrific compliment. Um, and, I, and I think that, uh, you know, Patrick Marva, who directed this, I think, I think he really made the most and the best of having a large number of actors on stage. Nowadays, you know, it's, this is a, a common place, but I'll say it, producers really want plays with three or four people in them. Mm. Uh, that makes sense as a, as a, as it were, a business model, sorry to yes. put it. Yes, and yours, yours had 32, I think. Yeah, I think so, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and not only that, it had four children. Mm. And to employ four children, you have to employ 12 uh, because of the regulations of different yes. types. Yes. Um, I never felt remotely apologetic about any of that. You know, Sonia said, write anything you like and I'll put it on. So Wonderful. I did. Wonderful. I, this, this, I, there's something I've been wanting to ask you for a long time. So this seems like a good opportunity to ask it. And I think the answer is going to be no, but I'll I'll go ahead anyway. It did strike me that the fact that I spent several years having long conversations with you about your past and asking you questions about your past, and during the course of which you gave me to read some very gripping and important materials, like the letters you had written to your mother every week for many decades, from about the 1940s till, till the year of her death in 1996. Um, and that you must have been thinking again about a bit about those letters in order to find them and let, let me have them. I, I sometimes used to ask myself whether that, the business that someone was in the world excavating your past while you were going about your life and going about your business, did that have the slightest effect on the evolution of a play about family history, or or am I barking completely up the wrong tree? Well, it didn't just <laughs> mind. I mean, that the, our our relationship over the five years was it um, something like that. Uh, our relationship was actually based on the Stockholm syndrome. Um, <laughs> I, I ended up being, feeling sorry for you, although you'd kidnapped me. <laughs> <laughs> well, That's you have very funny. Me, actually, but the, the fact is that you, were, you won't probably even remember this, but five years ago, uh, I thought, you know, well, good luck. You know, I'm not going to help here. I mean, I, I'll thank you for doing it, but you're on your own and so on. And I... I um, uh, and, and I had this... I think it was a carrier bag full of letters mm -hmm. I've written to my mother from childhood on. I didn't even know that she kept them all. Mm -hmm. Same, uh, there came a certain point where I just changed my whole attitude towards the book and towards, you know, my life being turned over. I just thought, oh, to hell with it. Uh, yes, and I, got the, I got the feeling you weren't particularly at ease with it in the early stages. And I, I suppose we never really talked about this because it wouldn't have been you know, on the table to talk about, but I did get the feeling that, yeah, that about halfway through you decided, oh, well, it's gonna happen. So I might, I might as well, you know, not, not mind about it. But was it disconcerting to feel that someone was busy excavating your life in those years, did you? Not while it was, um, I, I don't know, you know, how much, dirty linen uh, people actually want. The fact of the matter is that um, although by agreement between us, I, I read the typescript to see if there were any factual errors, and there were very, very few as far as I recall. In some way, I must have a talk with some neurobiologist <laughs> one day. In some way, I didn't actually the, the book didn't enter my brain. I was just doing this technical job of seeing yes. this thing there, which was untrue. And then when I'd done that, uh, there was a long pause. And then the book appeared actually as a proper book yes. with my picture on it and everything. And um, 
it's, it's a few months now since it was published and I still haven't read it because every time I open it to look at something or browse for a moment, um, the, that, that old feeling of, oh my God, you know, uh, do I really want to know that, about it? Yeah. No, of course, um, folks, it's a very disappointing book uh, when, if, it, if one is going to judge it by skeletons in the closet. I mean, it's not about, it's not about oh, being furtive about things. Yes, it is. It's about being furtive about things, but it's, it's, not, a, it's not about um, being worried about certain uh, some revelations. It was just sort of the feeling that, oh my Lord, I'd forgotten this. And I didn't yes. think I liked it. And I didn't like myself when it happened and so on. There was an interesting example of that when uh, you, you, there was a great romance in your early life when you were, when you were at Bristol. Um, you had a romantic, um, devoted love um, for uh, um, your your first your first great love. And I she I saw her and she lent me the letters that you had written to her, and they're very touching letters of an 18, 19, 20 year old young man who's who, uh, who's in love with this person and I remember early on you were you you really couldn't face the thought that these letters might see the light of day and actually when you read the typescript and there were some of those letters you didn't say a word I was I was actually sitting there waiting for you to say oh no do we really have to have these and it's as if you had decided it it, it, it wasn't <clears throat> going to cause you concern anymore it was almost <laughs> decided that, that they wouldn't reach my consciousness, although my, I didn't know, my vision bit of the cortex was taking them in, nothing else was. Um, yeah, that was, that was, uh, I'm glad, I'm happy to say that, uh, that uh, I'm still in touch with her. It, it was a, it was a great, much too long, unrequited love, I should add. Um, and, um, you know, here we are in our 80s, um, hmm. and we're, we're, still, we're still friends. That's extraordinary. And I also feel, as I was writing the book and, f and looking back on it, that you are a person, whether in your working life or in your personal life, who does tend to keep people in your life. I'm very struck by the fact that your, your friendships and your relationships on the whole uh, haven't gone away, that you've sort of kept people around you. Would you, do you, would you think of it like that, your life? Well, it's one of those questions um, which, man, which, is, which is as true as its opposite is true. Um, in other words, uh, I I, there are a lot of people I feel I've, as it were, I've, friendships I've, I've neglected and a few uh, that I've Sort of kept returning to. Um, I'm not. I'm not very dependent on friendship. I'm on. I'm very dependent on good relations. Mm. Um, what's What's the difference? Well, a friendship, I suppose, is a much more open, um, much more honest, perhaps, uh, and I. I think I probably tend to protect myself from too much honesty, even in friendship. Um, and that's partly because uh, I'm culpably self-sufficient uh, as a personality. Um, I keep saying things, and while I'm speaking, the contradiction is also coming through uh, in some other part of my brain. Um, no, I, I, you know, I don't think, I lived on my own for a long time, mm -hmm. most of my years, uh, or, or a lot of time. Um, I, I just lived on my own and um, I was never lonely, not for five mm -hmm. minutes. I think I'm more vulnerable now uh, 
Sabrina, bless her, went to London for a doctor's appointment the other day, and I felt miserable to be left for 24 hours. Um, it didn't seem yes. quite enough to have thousands of books I could turn to. Yes, or lots but, of people you could ring up. Yeah. I, I have, um, as I speak, I have to say that there are two or three sort of intellectual friendships where nothing personal much is discussed. Mm. Books are interminably discussed. Yes. Um, I just, I, I'm going to go to the audience questions uh, in a minute because I see some are lining up, but I just want to pick you up on one thing you said then, which is of course deeply interesting to me because I too have been thinking about this side of your character for some time now. Why is it culpable to be self-sufficient? You said I'm culpably self-sufficient. It's just a version of self-deprecation to say such things. Um, though I, I, I think I said culpably because there's something slightly antisocial about mm -hmm. self-sufficiency, and um, and I know that. I perform sociability much more than I generally feel it. Um, while it's going on, I have genuine love for being with people, this person, that person, whoever. No, no, so I better be, I better be accurate. Um, it's something I enjoy, I don't seek, and on the whole tend to fend off. But when I actually find myself, this is, hasn't happened for a year, at a dinner party, um, yeah. on the whole, I think it's great. And then I get home and find I've been performing great enjoyment. Yes, you make yourself sound a bit of a double agent. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> but let's not, go I'm going to go to the audience questions. I will, I will get you off that hook. Um, so yeah. Someone called Michael would like to know if you play any musical instruments. To my enormous regret, I do not. Um, you played the triangle in the school band in Darjeeling, didn't you? Well, you're very kind to think of that as a musical <laughs> instrument. I suppose it is. Uh, but um, I'm very envious of people who can sit down and play a piano and so forth. You don't keep a tune, do you? You're not, you're no. not a, no. No, I don't keep a tune. Um, it's really quite awful the way I fail to keep a tune. Um, I used to go to the opera quite a lot because Miriam, uh, my wife then, loves opera. And if I were asked whether I'd seen such and such a thing, I could only reply if you describe the set. <laughs> you also, I remember you went to see Aida in Egypt with her. Yes. And yes. when asked how you enjoyed it, you said, uh, well, it's better than Aida without the pyramids. Oh, did I? <laughs> you did. That was funny. Okay. Um, however, the next question is also about music. It's from Tom Grakowski, and uh, who wants to know about Dark Side, the radio play Dark Side. Um, he has he'd read, perhaps in my book, that you were approached about it um, when the Pink Floyd album came out, but only wrote it years later. He loves this radio play. So a little about how that came into being. Yes, I, I didn't have a Pink Floyd through my children, uh, principally William and Ed. Um, and I never really caught up properly uh, for quite a long time, um, which is to say, I'm, try I'm trying to get the dates right. I'm not sure if I have, but uh, I ignored Pink Floyd until my teenage children or even sub-teenage children discovered Pink Floyd. A friend of mine actually brought Dark Side of the Moon to me and said, you really, there's a wonderful play somewhere in there. And I remember it being propped up on the cupboard and doing nothing about it. But by the time I was asked to do this play for the BBC radio, uh, by that time, I didn't have to think twice. Uh, I, 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 just wanted to do it immediately. Mm. It's a very moving play because I think the character of Emily in that play speaks some speaks about something which is 
very important to you, which is the nature of the good and, and kindness and, and how a belief in kindness and kin is, is essential to, to living life properly. Well, indeed, um, uh, ages ago, I made a connection between kindred and kind, and it, this unfortunately doesn't work in translation. I had to kind of stop, mm. as it were, playing out this, laying this out, because it doesn't work in German or French or Italian. But in English, it always struck me as deeply meaningful mm. that to be kind meant to treat people like kin. Yes. Um, yes. And I've come back to that quite a lot here and there, as you say, in, in Dark Side as, as well. Uh, but Dark Side, um, for those who don't know it, in, incorporates the entire album. The album lasts about 39 minutes. The slot on the radio was 60 minutes. Um, and the actual, and I obviously wasn't going to write over, over the lyrics, so I was only writing uh, over the instrumental passages. Um, so as far as I recall, there's about seven minutes of lyrics on the album. Um, and I was just, as it were, making a play to mm. fill the gaps. Um, it's, ex it's, an ex it's an example of, of great ingenuity, actually. I just want to jump you on to another question because there are quite a few coming and I, I, I want to give people a chance. Um, this is a question about biography uh, from Anne Daniel, uh, uh, who says, you're quite fond of using a real historical person in a play, but then eliding them. A good example is Lord Byron as an absent presence in Arcadia. Um, uh, has Lee's biography changed your opinion of the project? Might we see Lord Byron in the flesh next time? I think I'd be scared of that, actually. Mm. Um, mm. Though, having written dialogue for Shakespeare, maybe I shouldn't be that scared of writing it for Byron, but yeah, it does kind of scare me. Um, but you have fictionalized real people quite often in your plays, and yet at the same time, many characters in the plays are pretty scathing about the biographical project. So there's, there's perhaps a sense in which you feel that fiction, fictional drama can do, can do something more telling with a real life story. I mean, I've just, I'm very good at just sort of blithely speaking complete nonsense. I mean, I wrote an entire play about A.E. Houseman. Um, a wonderful play. And I had no problem about pretending I knew how he'd speak so forth, not to mention the place of Utopia where I didn't even speak their language. That's mm. what I was still writing for them. Uh, so I don't know what the answer to that question is, um, but I, I um, have no particular desire to write about Byron, I'll say that much. Could I add a PS to something about music? I, I, or my wasted words on Pink no. Floyd? I want to say that right through my writing life, uh, I I felt that, uh, lucky to have piggybacked on different kinds of music, often chosen by other people. Um, and I mentioned rock and roll. Well, I, I, I really loved the play, the experience of watching the play, because there was lots of rock and roll music in it. Um, Travis's the first time was done with uh, ragtime music, for example, and it's important. There's something. It's important that I should understand this about my own work that uh, that I get that I kind of operate sometimes incorporating what I'd call a free ride, a free ride on the music. Um, <laughs> It's almost, I always feel, it's almost like cheating because the music can deliver an emotional impact, which is incredible, incredibly difficult to deliver in mere words. Mm. That's what I wanted to say. It's very interesting. Uh, I have two more questions if I have, I think I have time. Um, Zachary wants to know if you've ever acted yourself. Isn't that what we do? 
have you ever <laughs> not acted yourself, but acted, comma, yourself? Oh, whether I've been an actor? Yes, that's a very Stoppardian answer, if I may say so. Oh, sorry. No, I've never, um, I've never wanted to be an actor and couldn't be. But you like actors, don't you? You get on well with them. You like being in the room with them. And... I, love, I love all that. Mm. Um, and that brings me on to a question from Lawrence, which is about how you are willing to rewrite and tinker with text years after you originally wrote them. Novelists, he says, rarely do this. So why do you feel able to do this as a, as a playwright? And I've seen this in, in action when you've been in rehearsal with a classic play like Rosencrantz for its 50th anniversary production, and you've been quite willing to do little tweaks here and there. You know, it's a, that's a big question, and you're absolutely right. Um, you know, something, there's, there's a phrase I've been trotting out for 50 years now, and the phrase is that theatre is not a text, it's an event. And one is always, if one is present, most of the time one is not present, but when one is present, let's say, of a revival of a play in London and so forth. Uh, when one is present, um, it's the event one is looking after. And very often one's taste changes. Uh, you know, things which I liked decades before, I'm less fond of, if not actually dislike. Um, so I have no I'm, I'm trying to put myself in a good light here. I have no preciousness about mm. the text being sacred in any way at all. Uh, and I don't understand why anybody would be. But you, but it's, but it's you who wants to make the changes. You don't want other people no. changing your text. No. You want to change it yourself. That, that is true, that is true. Yeah. Um, do you think you're unusual in this? Do you think that most playwrights come into rehearsals and agree to switch things around or cut things or add things in the kind of flexible way that you do? Do you, do you, do you know how other playwrights work in that way? No, I have no idea, but sometimes it's not even me. I mean, there was a very successful uh, revival of travesties about five years ago. Uh, and there were some quite significant changes. They weren't radical, but they were, you know, uh, which uh, Patrick Marber, the director, uh, uh, sort of instituted. Um, I think that one of the one of the sides of me uh, is, uh, you know, the Tom who feels that. He's already proved this point. So if somebody wants to introduce a different entrance into the play, let's see what it's like. Mm. I wouldn't feel that way about the first time a play is being done. When you look back on your whole work, and this is this has the tone of and is indeed the last question, um, do you have a favorite play? And for different reasons, I probably answer differently. I mentioned rock and roll as being a sort of favourite because I just loved, uh, I just loved having the being had the gift that was handed to me of just putting in the music I liked. Um, uh, the Invention of Love is a play about a poet who was a very celebrated, brilliant classical scholar, a, an emender of ancient texts. Um, Houseman, uh, and that absolutely got to the center of me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I very happily read up to write that play for something like four years and was reluctant to stop reading Latin and reading various editors of various Latin poets. I had to force myself to just stop and start writing mm -hmm. something, and I enjoyed myself. So it's the memory of the pleasure of the work that has gone into the play, which is part of the affection for the play itself. Yes, I guess so, because I'm trying to not take the question as, um, as it were, 
inviting me to put my plays into batting order. Quite. Um, there's no such thing. No. Well, a cricketing metaphor, sorry. <laughs> no, I think it's terrific to end on a cricketing metaphor in Brooklyn. Uh, and I could, I could happily go on for another couple of hours, but I'm afraid we have to stop. So thank you, Tom, hugely for, for this really interesting conversation. Um, and many thanks to the Greenlight uh, Bookstore for hosting this and making this all run so smoothly. And a personal thanks um, from me to, my, to, to all the, the team at KNOP who are doing and have done such a wonderful job on this book in the States. Thank you all very much for coming too. Thank you. Thanks Hermione and thanks Tom. I just wanna say what a pleasure it's been to spend time in your company and to remind everyone, the link is once again there in the chat if you'd like to look at some of their books and you can see the recording on Greenlight's website and on our other social media later on. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. Have a good night.